Teach us to pray. This is the request the disciples made of Jesus. Of all the things they saw in Jesus as they watched him, walked with him, lived by his side day by day, this is what intrigued them most. What was so inspiring, so revolutionary, so dangerous or provocative? What did they hear in Jesus' words that was missing from every other teacher, scholar, or leader who came before? He taught them a prayer which has now become mindless to many after years of constant repetition. But what if in this one prayer, there's something for us that's just as inspiring and revolutionary as it was 2,000 years ago? I want to learn to pray like that. Jesus, teach us to pray. Oh, I'm on. Well, how, good morning, Two Rivers. How are we? So if you didn't know, uh, and Nate knew, because he texted me last night and asked me uh, to set a picture of what my outfit looked like today. If you didn't know, today is National Dress Like Your Favorite Person Day. So, uh, so far in two services, I don't know what to think of this. You're the only one that dressed like me. So Flattered. You're flattered? Yes. So No, I'm flattered yes. that you... Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. He's so nervous. Yeah. You'd think he wouldn't be being up here, but it's a different type of... Look at him. He's like, you're going to do this to me again. Hey, welcome. Uh, my name is Nick. If I have never had the opportunity to meet you, part of the Two Rivers team here. And uh, man, I love this place. I really, really do. I think I say it every time I get the opportunity to. I love this place. Um, I love just being... One of your all's pastors, and I take it as an honor, truly an honor, um, to just be here and be able to deliver God's word from time to time. If you're a first-time guest, whether you're in person, online, in our overflow room, a special welcome to you just to give us some of your time on a Sunday morning. Thank you, uh, and I hope this uh, experience just feels like home for you and family, and you can dig into God's word with us. So as Sarah just said, week two of six of our prayer series, Teach Us to Pray. Last week was kind of a 50,000 foot level on why pray? What is it? Why do we engage? Why should we take this age old, timeless spiritual practice seriously? And as Sarah says, statistics even show majority of Christians, if they're being honest, struggle in this area. And it's one of the most intimate things we can engage in with God, yet most of us struggle. So what we're doing is we're turning to the model prayer, right? That when the disciples came to Jesus, and remember, they watched him do almost everything publicly and even privately. And of all of the things they witnessed him do, the one thing we see in scripture, them asking him to teach them to do is to pray. Of all the things, meaning they saw something about Jesus' prayer life where they're like, something's different there, so much so that we need you, we want you, we desire for you to teach us. We see that phrase, teach us to pray, actually in Luke, and we see a little bit of the model prayer there, but then we see the extended model prayer, what has traditionally been known as the Lord's Prayer. If you grew up Catholic, it's known as the Our Father, the by far most recited prayer worldwide. But when Jesus gave this prayer, he did not give it to us to be just a mindless uh, prayer that we recite over and over again. Now, can we recite it? Is there power within it? Sure. But they didn't say teach us a prayer. They said teach us to pray. And this is his response. So starting today and over the next five weeks, we're going to break down every sentence of this prayer because there is power and meaning in it through what Jesus is trying to teach us. So if we would, our memory verses for this month. So if you're part of the Two Rivers family, even if you're not, you want to join us in this. We have challenged our family every month to memorize a different verse or verses because uh, there's power in the word of God to saturate our minds and our hearts with it and let it direct our lives. This month's uh, um, verses that we want you to memorize, again, not to be a prayer that we recite all the time, but there is power in memorizing the Lord's Prayer. And just like last week, I'd love for you to read it with me. Now, you may have memorized it in a different version. I did. So I have to still look at it in this version, right, which is the NIV, which is the one that we mostly preach out of. If you haven't memorized it yet, all the verses will be up on the screen. But would you please read this with me? We'll start at the actual Our Father part. You ready? Here we go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. Flashbacks of my Catholic upbringing. Woo! Not a bad way, a good way, right? I like that. I just love us all joining together to say God's word. So there's three main types of prayer. And I'm not trying to box prayer in here, but just to kind of give you a general overview. And we're going to talk over the next five weeks about each one of these revolved around what Jesus is teaching. There's upward prayers, there's inward prayers, and there are outward prayers. All significant, all important. I think the one that we're tend to prone to and move to the most is inward. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all that our prayers are is inward, as I said last week, we end up just swimming in the shallow end of the pool our entire Christian lives. And that's not where God wants us. And you may not even know it yet. That's not where you really want to be or need to be. There's, there's deeper uh, uh, grounds there, right, to swim in, and it starts with the upward prayer. It's the reason Jesus started here. He started with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. There's two words, right, our Father. So easily roll off our tongues if you've been in church for a while, but there's so much power in just those two words, right? What Jesus is doing right from the beginning of this prayer is making it personal and intimate. This holy, righteous God who created and sustains all things, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, ever-present, not only allows us but get this, encourages us for those that are actually Jesus Christ followers to call him Father. I just want to pause for a second. Maybe that doesn't hit you like it once did, or maybe it really hasn't hit you yet. I hope it does by the end of here. See, to the disciples, this was a revolutionary concept. One of the books that I'm going to be quoting from, I quoted from it last week. I'll actually quote from it more this week and throughout this sermon series. I read it recently. It's actually where this sermon idea series came from as I was reading this earlier this year. Um, it's called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. And I want to preface this. Anytime I reference a book up here, for those of you that are newer to the church, right, you can make sure it is a book that I have read the Bible right alongside of it, right? Because if it's not rooted in the word of God, it literally is no fruit inside of it as far as our spiritual lives. And I can tell you this is very much rooted in the word of God. Um, and, and sometimes, let's be honest, most of the time, there's people out there that say it way better than I can. So why not just quote them, right? And here's what he says on this whole idea of the Our Father when it comes to the disciples. Remember, the disciples... Are, are, we grew up Jewish, steeped in Jewish tradition, and didn't really have this closeness with God. So here's what he says on this. The disciples likely gasped when, when Jesus said, Our Father. The temple that served as the training ground for their prayers had taught them to pray with supreme reverence. We'll get to that on the back end. The grounding text for the Jewish people's understanding of God was the book of Exodus. When the Lord appeared to the people in the form of a cloud by day and fire by night. The big question in the ancient days wasn't, does God exist? It would be foolish to ask such a question. Of course God exists. Open your eyes, man. Here's this centrical pillar of, of um, stretching from the desert floor into the night sky. Oh, uh, sit, sit. Here we go again. Centrical pillar of fire, I missed that word, stretching from the desert floor to the night sky and serves as our trail guy, right? That's how God showed up to the, uh, the Israelites as he brought them through the desert. It was a fire by night and a, a cloud by day. Instead, the existential question in ancient days was, is God knowable? Not does he exist, is he knowable? Because a pillar of fire doesn't provoke doubt, but neither does it provide intimacy. These disciples knew a God of cleansing rituals and animal sacrifices, a God of ten plagues and blood of doorposts, a God who parts seas and floods the earth, a God with a heavy hand of deliverance and a heavy hand of judgment. Awesome in power, but hard to get to know. Jesus did nothing to diminish the reverence, nothing to minimize the power of God. Jesus made that powerful God knowable. This was revolutionary for them. Again, where it may just flow off our tongues as, oh, you know, yeah, he's my father. To them, I could imagine them saying, wait, 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 wait. Go back to those first two words that you said, Jesus. What, what was that again? 
Our father? See, the word father in the Old Testament, this is before Jesus Christ ever came, was only used around 14 times, and it was never in a personal sense. In the New Testament, G, uh, father, patea, is the Greek word, is used over 350 times. It's the word most often used when referencing God by Jesus and the disciples. In these two words alone, This is how powerful they are. It captures the essence of what Christianity is all about. The mere fact, right, that you and I are sinners. Every single person that's ever been born separated by God, no matter how big or small your sin is, no matter what side of the tracks that you grew up on, no matter how how much money you have or don't have, no matter how great your sin is, whatever it is, it does not matter. Just one sin puts us all at the level playing field, which is separation from a holy, righteous God. And it's only through the death, burial, and resurrection and completed work of Jesus Christ that we are ever made right and ushered back into the presence, into this intimate, personal relationship with God. It screams of the essence of Christianity, the right, the fact that God would graciously forgive those sins, past, present, and future, adopt us into his eternal family, and restore his own image in us, thus allowing us to truly be his eternal sons and daughters, is all encapsulated in our Father. John 1 says it this way. This is one of Jesus' closest disciples, John, in his biography on Jesus says right in the get-go, he says right from the get-go, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. That's still true today, by the way. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to all who believed, and that word believed is have faith and put their confidence and trust in, in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision, but born of God. Common misconception in this world is that all of human beings are God's children, not true scripturally. We're all his creation But only those that have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and have dedicated to follow him, yes, imperfectly, are invited in and adopted in to the eternal family of God and are made children of God. Right before this, Jesus' whole section in Matthew 6, Jesus is teaching on prayer. He stops in the middle of his greatest sermon ever preached most well-known, Matthews 5 through 7, it's known as the Sermon on the Mount, teaches some of the hardest teachings, flipped everything upside down. He kind of comes right in the middle right now, and he's like, hey, let me, let, me, let me lean in on something that's so important, prayer. And in verse 5, right before he goes into the Lord's Prayer, he says this, when you pray, right, there's that assumption again that, man, as followers, we're just going to engage in this because it's that powerful. Do not be like the hypocrites, For they love standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. He moves from pride and arrogance, which we can so easily clothe ourselves in, as if we're better than the rest of the world because somehow we have faith that they don't have, to intimacy, humility, and awe. Hey, don't be like that. There's enough pride and arrogant Christians in the world, and most of them just push people away from the heart of God and his son, Jesus Christ. Stay in this humble position. You want to know how to stay in the humble position? One of the ways is when you have prayer time, you start in the position of humility. How do we start there? We preach the gospel to ourselves, and we remember who God is. That's why he started this whole prayer off this way, the great Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Although Martin Luther King was, I think, named after the great Martin Luther, right? The leader of the Reformation in the 1500s, quoting Tim Keller. Uh, Not Martin Luther is not quoting Tim Keller. Tim Keller is quoting Martin Luther in his book on prayer. He says that this was a call to not plunge right into talking to God, but to first recollect our situation and realize our standing in Christ before we proceed into prayer. We are to say to God, you have taught us to regard you and call upon you as one father of us all, although you could rightly and properly be a severe judge over us all. 
Therefore, we should start by asking God to implant in our hearts a comforting trust in your fatherly love. What a great starting place. Now, I also get this. Right, and if you read Psalms, right, Psalms, that word means prayers and petitions and songs of praise. They literally would sing the Psalms back in the day. And it was 75 of the 150 were written by King David himself, who was known after God's own heart, a man after God's own heart. But if you read those Psalms, King David is all over with his prayers. He struggled in them. There's some times where he wouldn't start with adoration and praise. He would just start with, hey, God, where are you? You ever been there? Like my point today, and I don't think Jesus' point is that, hey, we can't be honest with God, that somehow we have to like fake it. Hey, God, you're awesome and you're worthy. When there's times where I just want to be like, God, I'm not feeling that today. I'm struggling and I mightily need your help and guidance and wisdom. But overall, if that's the only thing that encompasses our prayer life, again, that we're only coming to God when we're in desperate need, our prayer life and yet our journey as Christians will again be so shallow. So to cultivate a beautiful rhythm of prayer, to be intentional in that, not just sporadic in that, which are great as well, sporadic prayers, but intentional, it is to start right here with a meditation on the fact that he is our father. Now, before I move on, I want to ask you this question, and I want to address this. Not to be some psychologist or counselor up here, but man, this is a real thing for so many people, many in this room and many watching online, possibly. When you think of God as your father, what emotions does that evoke in you? Because maybe some of you couldn't put your finger on it, but you hear us talk about this personal and intimate God, and yes, you want to know that and believe that, and you are a follower of Jesus, but you have struggled in this area, and it may be because of your relationship with your, or lack thereof, Father on this earth. And it's human nature, right? It's human nature to, to uh, reflect or to project our, our, our experiences in this earth on God. It's natural. And if we didn't have a great experience or we don't have a great experience, right, it's hard for us to picture this great, kind, perfect, righteous, loving, unconditional God. And if that is you, can I, not that you need my permission, but maybe you just need to call that out for what it is between you and God. He already knows. Maybe that's a starting place for you. Maybe it's coming and being like, God, I know you're my father because I believe your truth and I believe your word and I understand I am your daughter. I understand that I am your son, but man, I am struggling to make this my starting place because of, again, a relationship I have on this earth and I can't see you as any other way. Start there. Maybe let some of your brothers and your sisters know and they can start praying that and just watch God over time. Maybe change your mind and your heart through the truth of his word and the experience of him on this earth and others around you. Just start to change that in you to where you can now see God truly as much as we can this side of heaven, right? As imperfect, broken people, as truly a loving, caring father in the truest sense of those words. This is why this is so important. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, to quote him again, says it this way. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his or her worship and prayers and his or her whole outlook on life, it means that they do not understand Christianity very well at all. Now, That can seem very judgmental and condescending. But from the angle of what I just talked about, I don't believe it is. I just believe there is something there that we have to learn to lean into. And for you, it's putting your finger on it. If that is a struggle of yours, it may be other things. It may be sin in your life that you're ignoring. It may just be that, hey, you're a a newer believer. And again, you got to learn to crawl before you can walk and walk before you can run. And there's just time that has to evolve there of learning and experiencing God in ways that you never have and given perspectives through his truth. But figure out what that is and learn to regularly come and not just reference him as father flippantly, 
But man, to learn to meditate on just that idea of this. It's so important. He goes on to say, if this is not the thought, I said the prompts uh, very well, for everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new, the better than the old, everything that is distinctly Christian, as opposed to merely Jewish, is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. And I love this next part. Father is the Christian name for God. Right? We just did this whole same God series where we focused on five of the, there's, uh, there's many more than five, but five names of God, all from the Old Testament. And it's not like the New Testament's ushered in and that's not God anymore. No, 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 no. Those are names of God eternally and will only be names of God eternally. It speaks of who he is and his character. But I love what J.I. Packer here said. If there's a name of God that is elevated of all the other names of God because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, it is Father, Abba. Father, and reminding yourselves of that regularly actually does something for you and for me as well, right? God, God doesn't need you. He doesn't need my praise. So it really transforms us and reminds us in the middle of reminding ourselves of who he is. It reminds us of what we have in him as sons and daughters, eternally loved, secure, and worthy. Tyler in his book says, adoration given to God is always given back to us. As we lift our eyes, right, recovering a true view of God's identity, we also recover his view of us as well as our own identity as loved, secure, worthy children of the Most High King. Let's talk about that for a second. Let's lean into that for a second, right? Love. Again, we we are loved in this world to some extent, but not to the extent that God loves us. And we forget that. We need to be reminded of that. Our Father encapsulates that as your uh, your Father and my Father. Love. Stanton goes on to say, when we call God our Father, we are equally remembering that we are completely, uniquely loved. Until we know that love, I love how he says this, nothing can truly be right in us. But after that simple revelation, something becomes irrevocably right within us at the deepest level. When we pray our Father, we are really asking him to remind us again today that we are loved. And yes, even the manliest man in this room needs to be reminded that you are loved on a regular basis. Even though that may not have been your experience, even though that the world may say that's weakness to, 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 um, to lean into that, you desperately need it like the next person because you were created by the same God who put that desire and that need in you to be loved and known by love himself. It's all over the New Testament. 1 John 3.1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished, I love that word, on us, poured out on us that we should be called children of God. Romans 5.8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How about the, the famous John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he what? Just told us about it? No, he does that. He showed us. He put it into action. The greatest act of love ever was sending his one and only son to die a horrible death, be buried and rise so that you and I could be in this loving, eternal relationship with him that is unconditional and is unwavering. It's not like the love that we often experience in this world, which we need as well. God has given us community for that, but our love is often sometimes fickle. It is wavering. It is conditional, but not God's. Secondly, is secure. As a a son and a daughter of the most high king, our father, we have security and worth. John 10, 27 and 29, Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Similarly, in the end of Romans 8, where he says, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing, right, can separate you. Again, it doesn't matter what side of the tracks you grew up on. It doesn't matter what sin you have fallen back into. It doesn't matter how apathetic you've become in your faith. If you truly are a child of God, you are forever adopted and grafted in to the eternal family. 
I use this example a lot. Maybe one of you need to hear this again that is struggling in this area. And maybe some of these verses, which by the way, if you didn't know on our app, right on the front screen says this weekend, you click that and the top left box says sermon notes. Every week there's electronic sermon notes that you can uh, email to yourself. Maybe some of these verses need to be your verses for July. It's okay. The point is memorizing scripture that God can use in your life. And here's the reminder I want to give you. For those that have children, you know this. They, my four children can move as far away from me as they want to try to get away from me. They can change their last name. They can get a tattoo, their new name, on wherever they want on their body. And yet, they will forever have my blood and forever be my children. As children of God, you're no different. And I know it doesn't always feel that way. I know there's guilt and shame that come over you because that's what Satan wants. And there is conviction that can be healthy and lead to repentance. That will be later on in this sermon series. Confession, there's so much power in that. But at the end of the day, even if we fail to do that, God is a loving God. And yes, there are earthly consequences. And yes, there's a, there's a potential uh, a waywardness and, and a, um, kind of a, a hindrance in our relationship. But that's not because of God. That's because of us. But at the end of the day, you're still secure as a child of God. So he says, our Father. And then he says, in heaven. I don't want to skip that. I think it's a beautiful transitional phrase into hallowed be your name. See, God is personal. But let's not also forget, he's also holy, righteous, sovereign, omnipresent. There's a bigness to God. We don't want to shrink him down so small that he's my homeboy and I get it you know, on my shirt. If you have that shirt, that's fine. Just go burn it when you get home. God's not your homeboy. He's not. Jesus is your friend, but God's not your homeboy. He is your sovereign Lord, the maker of everything seen and unseen. And if we lose that reverence, We honestly lose even the fatherhood part of it, not lose eternally, but this whole idea goes together. Jesus starts here, but then he brings it back out. Hey, yes, while God is your father, he's also huge, large, and in charge. See, our father is a reminder of God's intimacy, hallowed as we move into that, as a reminder of his separateness, his majesty, and as one author said, his incomprehensible greatness. And there's value in both. And they actually link together. That word hallowed. Have anybody ever like been reading your Bible and even just kind of like memorizing this verse and like stopped on this word and like, why is this word still in our modern Bibles? Like there's no other old English word that has made it through the NIV, ESV, ANS, ASB translations, but hallowed. Why is that word still in our Bibles? I think it's actually beautiful. Many theologians believe because there really isn't a modern English word that translates well. The closest one is holy, but honestly, we struggle with that word too. I do. Like to understand the holiness of God. But that word hallowed in the Greek actually means to treat as absolute, sacred, and ultimate. To revere as not just the top of our list, but like far beyond anything else on our list of importance and priorities is hallowed. And it's a cry for God to be hallowed in our lives, in this church, and in this world around us. And and it's a cry to, to start adorning him for not just the intimate father that he is, very important, but again, all the other wonderful things that he is. Again, Tyler writes... This, he says, the pendulum of popular thought has swung between Jesus' time and our own. We are comforted by the sentimentality, is one of those words, of our Father, a title that scandalized the ancient world, but we are equally scandalized by the devoted deference of hallowed be your name. Words that would have comforted the ancients. And it is for this precise reason that we need the second line of the Lord's Prayer every bit as much as the ancients needed the first couple words. Subconsciously, he says, I tend to believe the world is a neutral place. It's not. 
The world is a contested place where almost always a name other than Jesus is being worshipped. When you and I open our mouths and begin to pray, almost certainly another name is being hallowed in our hearts. The names of accomplishment, success, productivity, approval from another person, comfort, easy execution of our own wills and plans, self-will and all its destructive varieties. When we pray, we step out of the fundamental reality of the world and into the fundamental reality of God, so we must be begin by inviting God to reorder our affections. It was one of my points last week of why pray, because it realigns our hearts with the heart of God. And I don't know about you, it doesn't take long for me to be in the world for my heart to start getting pegged in the wrong directions. It's so easy. It's what I'm talking to the young adults tonight in the young adult service, right? Why we so desperately need community and how some of us shy away from it because God uses community, the right community, the community that's focused on the truth of God, that cares about their brothers and sisters to often realign our priorities to help us along the way. Sometimes we wander and don't even know we're on the wrong road. You ever do that when you're hiking? Quail Ridge, one of my favorite places, this came out of nowhere, but I remember taking my little boy about four years ago and I get to one point, we're like two hours in and I'm like, hey buddy, I don't know where the heck we are, right? You ever been to Quail Ridge? I love it, but it's like their, their directions are horrible. Like we wandered off and I wandered off for an hour. I didn't even realize, man, I'm on the wrong road. You ever done that in your Christian life? Absolutely. He realigns our affections. Prayer flows from the posture of our hearts toward God, not from reaction to the world around us. Everything that comes from the name of God being hallowed in the heart of the praying or, I'm sorry, prayer after the first movement is on, wait, let me say it again. Everything that comes from the Lord's Prayer after this first movement is an overflow of the name of God being hallowed in the heart of the praying person. Teach us to pray, the disciples say to Jesus, and he responds in essence, start by remembering who you're talking to. Biblically, we are commanded to remember more frequently than we are to obey. Remember, remember. Remember, it's why the Old Testament uh, uh, Jewish people were, were told, do this ceremony regularly. Put these stones and stack them up and go to them often so you don't forget who God is. Because the world has their opinion. Satan is moving throughout it, and he's constantly wanting to get you off focus off that. Change the worldview, thus change the projection of your life and the affections of your heart. And God wants us to regularly, no, come back. Come back. Remember, I am your father, but man, hallow my name for your benefit, for the trajectory of your life. Man, we must fight against apathy in our prayer lives, y'all. Familiarity leads to a lazy prayer life. And for those of you that have been doing this for a while, your struggle is not how to pray. Your struggle should be apathy. It's familiarity. Oh, I've been doing this for a long time. And your prayers may have just become just mundane, robotic. And this is a call to say, nope. I need, a, I need a renewed, refreshed prayer life, God. Why not just come back to the basics of adoration and our Father, hallowed be your name. We want to help you with that. We've created an adoration sheet. And maybe this is where you're at. Maybe you're like, man, I get into prayer and I'm so distracted. Go back to the religious elimination series, right? That'll help with that. But you're like, I don't even know where to start. I try to think of God, and man, all these other thoughts come into my head, and that could be spiritual warfare. It could just be where you're at in life, and you need to really start eliminating some things. But in the meantime, you can take a screenshot of that QR code. Also in our notes on the app, all the way at the bottom, uh, you can click. There's a PDF. Um, we will also email this out in our weekly newsletter. I wouldn't wait there, and I would print this off. Okay, I understand some of you are phone people. You know my heart is when you're spending your time with God in the mornings, don't have your phone out. It's such a distraction, right? Do a paper Bible. This you can print off, and it really is 12 characteristics and attributes of God with Scripture right there. Just start there. Dependable, patient, ever-present, faithful, good, righteous, holy, kind, loving, mighty, near, and trustworthy. Just start there. Another suggestion, and I've given this before, is most mornings, I won't say all, my wife and I get up early, we have coffee, we sit, and we sit in silence, typically for five to ten minutes, we'll set an alarm, and that's really just to just be in silence. We don't get a lot of that, right? It's good for the heart, it's good for the soul. I'm not trying to prove anything in that silence, I'm just letting my soul be silent. And then coming out of that, I will play a song 
a worship song, what they call a you are worship song. There's different styles of worship songs, different kinds of worship songs. You are worship songs, like the one we're getting ready to sing at the end here. We're going to introduce a new one. If you want to know what it is called Such an Awesome God, that could be your song for this week where you just play that. Maybe it's Psalm 23 by Shane and Shane, and all you're doing is you're allowing that song just remind you of the goodness of God and who he is. Before you ever even enter full prayer, Last suggestion I have is on the YouVersion Bible app. If you don't have it downloaded, by far one of the best, if not the best, Bible app out there. Right on the front, there's a guided prayer that you can do every day, and they just help you. Maybe you just need some help. Maybe you just need a little bit of encouragement in that. A guided prayer will help you. Obviously, we have our prayer team as well that is willing to help you engage in that as well uh, and pray for you. Let me end with this, right? It's so easy to skip over by what we've talked about today and just waltz into prayer with God telling him what we think we need and want. And again, there's a place and there's a time for that and God wants it all. It's all part of a relationship. But there's a reason Jesus started the model prayer the way that he did, right? There is power in the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ and the fact that we bring nothing to the dance, that without God, Jesus said it himself, I am nothing, that apart from Jesus and a relationship with him, I can do nothing eternally. I can produce no fruit, John 15, that man, I have to regularly, I don't care how long you've been doing this Christian life. Sometimes the longer you've been doing it, the more we need to drop to our knees. And just remember regularly, possibly multiple times a day, God, you are holy. You are kind, you are loving, but man, you are my father. Thank you, Jesus. Let me start there today. Let me end with this. Um, Again, going back to the Psalms. Maybe another cool place to start. Just read a Psalm a day. There's a lot of them. This is where Tim Keller started several years ago when his prayer life kind of dried up. We're talking about the great late Tim Keller, if you don't know, just a wonderful man of God. Prayer life just started to dry up. He started by just reading a psalm a day. He did it for two years straight. Man, it will encourage you, I'm telling you. Remember who you're reading most of the time. King David, a man after God's own heart. You're like, that guy wrote that? Curse my enemies, God? Sometimes he's crying out to God saying, God, where are you? (laughs) But in almost every one of those prayers, he comes back around into the adoration of God. Let me read one of those. If you would, stand with me. And then we'll pray. 68, start in verse 32. Here's what he says. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, who thunders with a mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the heavens. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Let's pray. God, sometimes I am that guy that even between you and I just wants to come up with these eloquent words to describe as if somehow you'll be more proud of me. But what about just the simple word of awesome? (laughs) And I understand every person in this room might not be in a place in their life where they can stand here confidently and say, yeah, you are an awesome God. You're such a good God. You're such a loving God. And I think there's humility and honesty in that, that Father, you meet them where they are. And if that's them today, meet them there, Father, through your spirit that I know is in this room and wants to move mightily in every one of our lives in a powerful way, not in an emotional sense, but in a uh, a transforming type of way, Lord. Just meet that person or persons where they are strengthen them through who you are, who you've always been, who you are, and who you will forever be. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ who made what we're doing right here and right now even possible. 
Help us not to take it for granted. Give us a continued desire. And if that desire is not there, give us the will through the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit to step into something that you have given us that is a privilege and so powerful as prayer and community together. Father, even when I don't want to feel it or I don't feel it, you're still awesome. You're still wonderful. You're still great. You're still mighty. May that be what resonates throughout this place, not just on Sunday mornings, but as we leave as your church called Two Rivers, as your sons and daughters, may that be what just flows out of us as we interact with this world that is so desperately crying out for something that they don't even know they're missing. Help us to be the ambassadors that you've called us to be for you and you alone, your glory, Lord. May us magnify your son and glorify your name in all we think, say, and do. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.